Welcome back to Philosophy for the People, and I hope you are all ready for Jim's easy money argument easy money. against materialism. This is an exciting day, my friends, because we're too going to easy. Do... <laughs> it's, it's almost too easy, right? Too easy. We're going in the uh, way back machine to a paper that Jim, uh, this was published, what, you said about 10 years ago? 10, uh, 11 like years ago, 2011, I think it was. Yeah, it's, okay. it was before Mind, Matter, and Nature, so I think I cite it in that book. Interesting. So, yeah. you know, it's always it's always risky business going back to anything you wrote even two weeks ago. Um, yeah. For fear that you might just throw yourself off of a bridge thinking, no, no, no human could ever write so badly. What, no, what, no. what was going on? Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, every once in a while, you look back on something you did a while ago and you don't absolutely hate it. And yeah. if, I, if I'm correct, this is this is this is sort of the relationship you bear with this paper. You're actually quite happy with this product. Is that right? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Jim, you got muted there. I managed to disconnect myself. That's OK. You're good now. Yep. It's a, it's a Henry Rollins lyric, by the way. Anyway, so uh, pull my brainstem out and disconnect myself. Anyway, what poetry? Uh, what poetry? A poet, a true poet, um, and, a, and a gentleman at that. Anyway, <laughs> that's all um, I've heard. Yeah, that's what I heard. So um, yeah, I wrote this paper in 2011, and I haven't I hadn't looked at it for a while. I can't remember why yesterday I thought that I would be so self-indulgent as to suggest that we discuss it on air, but, but, but I, don't, I don't know why. Right. So, uh, well, I, to be fair, I've actually asked you to do that before of saying, yeah, let's yeah. go back through some old yeah, look at some papers. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, I mean, I look, went back and looked at the paper. It was interesting in that I can see that this was where the turn toward it, like externalism happened in my mm -hmm. thinking. Okay. And I don't think I realized it at the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that's when it happened. Okay, and, so let's let yeah. for the, for this episode, let us define terms as we move along. So when we talk about externalism, let's yeah. uh, let's get that on the table first. Of, okay, or if so, you want to wait, that's yeah, fine too. No problem. One second, I have a little plug-in problem here. Yeah, I want to. Sure. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, for, so um, externalism, and what I mean there is. Okay, so the, you can talk about externalism, uh, about well, so the, so you have you have theories of externalism in the reference debates about reference, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have someone like uh, Kripke is an externalist in a sense, right? In that he doesn't think there's internally available descriptive content that fixes the references to our terms right yeah. so mm -hmm. so it's like you know kurt girdle invent was the discoverer of the incompleteness of arithmetic is not what fixes reference for us right that internally accessible like consciously accessible description i might use to define the name kurt girdle is not what fixes the reference and kripke gives various arguments for that okay you have externalists about propositional content like uh hillary putnam mm -hmm. okay uh building on this right and um you know so putnam's an externalist about content in the sense that uh he thinks whether or not i have a belief about water i have belief about some other substance that could be my environment that descriptively is just like water is not something that is internally accessible to me, to me it's right. decided by the world external to me mm -hmm. yeah right mm -hmm. okay um, and then you can go all the way, and I do, to like externalism about mind. And like like John McDowell uh, has a famous quip. I think it's I forget which, which one of his papers is in, where he says, uh, "Yeah." So so uh, Putnam's famous quip is, uh, "Meanings ain't in the head." Right? McDowell goes so far as to say, "Minds ain't in the head either." Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So you so you can go like ex externalism about reference. You can go externalism about propositional content. Or you can go externalism about minds. We're, we're literally seeing minds are not just internally contained in first order consciousness that they're spread out somehow in the in the environment of the world that somebody's right. in. Right? And uh, theories of knowledge as well. Right. And oh yeah. And exactly. Michael Bergman. Right. Uh. Mm -hmm. I, I think. And obviously he's Heineken, an externalist. But, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And Bergman, I think, is taking the mantle up there, where an externalist in theories of knowledge is saying. The conditions uh, that mark the difference between, uh, you know, mere true belief, right, and knowledge are not internally accessible, right? That's right, yeah. And so what all of these have in common is that whatever criteria we're looking for, whether it's for reference, whether it's for propositional content, whether it's for uh, knowledge, whether it's for mindedness as such, is not available in the first order self-consciousness of the agent 
holding these, right? It's it's something that's external to them. Right. right. And right. we may or may not have access to it. Is that we right? We may or yeah. may not have access that's to right. it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you think in epistemology, you know, you have these the classic uh foundationalism internalist theories right the idea is right. like we can we can dig down <laughs> deep right. enough right to something some some incorrigible and incorruptible foundation of knowledge and then build up through deductive arguments to some some great web of, of knowledge thereafter some sort of cartesian product that would be internalist and at least in that stronger form i think most most epistemologists are like yeah that just that just doesn't work right but right. then you mentioned uh in theories of knowledge people like planiga and, and bergman who will say no what's going to give you warrant which is that sort of quality that raises you just from yeah mere true belief to actual knowledge it's going to depend on a sort of structure of the world beyond us right, right. certain conditions and planiga obviously has his conditions and, and bergman has his own so but the point is is it's it's not something that we, that is yeah it's just beyond the boundaries of ourselves right right, uh, right. and that, but yours is more related um, not in epistemology this argument but more in philosophy of mind is that right exactly yeah, yeah so point. and and you get interesting overlaps on these positions so for instance like someone like Wilfred Sellers is probably an internalist about um, knowledge mm -hmm. okay he, he thinks you need to be able to know that you know to show right that you are and and, and the other Pittsburgh schools would be guys would be interesting question where they are on that. Uh, but he's definitely an externalist about like mindedness, I think, right? Or certainly the other Pittsburgh school guys are, right? Do you, you mm -hmm. see that? So I think you get interesting questions of overlap there, right? Like which of these theories map onto each other. So a lot of times I think when I say I'm an externalist, people will hear me as saying I'm like in the planning of bird. Obviously, I'm a Purdue guy. Like I like I, I like went to grad school in the Fertile Crescent of epistemic <laughs> journalism, right? Or not the Fertile, like 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 the first stop from Notre Dame, like Purdue, right? <laughs> you know, like the, like the Fertile Crescent. Right? I mean, <laughs> right. Like like uh, Bergman was literally planning a student, right? <laughs> right? So yeah. I mean, like so externalism was in the air in grad school. Uh, I I don't really have a terribly strong opinion about externalism in epistemology anymore. I used mm -hmm. to be like hardcore because I was I learned my lessons well. And I also think Aristotle was an externalist, but I don't think he actually is. Um, right? Yeah, that's in that's the, interesting. That sense, yeah. yeah, not to get not to go off uh, off topic here, but yeah. um, that is that is an area that interests me of how to think about Aristotle and Aquinas. And at least, I mean, I I think probably the majority position is that he's an internalist, right? Yeah. Um, however, Eleanor Stump and a number of others have argued for an externalist understanding of Aquinas, and by extension through to Aristotle. So it is a, it is an area of debate and, yeah. and it's a fascinating yeah. one, but for another conversation, right. Right? for that conversation, because what now in this, in this paper that we're going to talk about, I was less self-consciously internally, right. Uh, aware of like what I was doing was staking out an externalist position. I was more just making an argument against materials, but I can see now the stuff I'm doing there where it develops, you know, 10, 11 years later. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so the paper is sort of well, it's uh, it's called Realism, Nominalism, and Biological Naturalism. Uh, I published it in um, the International Philosophical Quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, we the links in the in the, the comments. The section. links will be available. Yep, they'll mm -hmm. be available. And um, really, it's it's sort of a polemical piece against Searle. Okay, or uh, I'm using Searle to frame the debate. Okay, mm -hmm. and so I take Searle's basic argument against reductive versions or limitless versions of materialism as a given okay so mm -hmm. i think it's important to understand john searle uh you know is is some kind of sort of property dualist though he doesn't like that phrase okay mm -hmm. um but he doesn't think you can just neatly identify mental states with brain states. He thinks the idea of eliminating the notion of the mental is just incoherent, all that. And, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of that work is sort of like, you know, so well known to be passe now. Right. But I do, I do think Searle stuff is still very much worth reading. I think if you want oh, like sure. decent yeah. introductions of philosophy of mind, I think the rediscovery of the mind and mind uh, is it a brief introduction. I, I think it's what's called very good books, very yep. good books. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so, I take all that as a given. So let's, so let's, so step one of the argument, let's assume reductive materialism is off the table. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what Searle goes for, um, and I'm using the, no, the nomenclature, the you know, terminology that he uses, I think more in the rediscovery of mind than he does in like mind, a brief introduction. Um, mm -hmm. but anyway, so Searle stakes out a position that he calls at some point biological naturalism. 
Okay, so he doesn't want to say that the mental is identical to or can be eliminated in favor of the physical, okay, or or the neuro neurophysiological is his term. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he does think he in, in in like in rediscovery mind, he will say he's gonna accept some kind of supervenience. Okay. Right. Now mm -hmm. People get really PO'd at Searle because what he's what he means by supervenience here is not like what like Kim means by supervenience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay, fair enough. We can all we've all got sacred cows. Okay. Uh and and so like like what what Kim means by supervenience, and I'm just gonna like say this in like in a very convenient way and, and we could pick at this, so forgive me, right? Is Kim's version of supervenience would be a sort of like like materialism. Okay, yes. the kind that Cyril's mm -hmm. rejecting. So, like for him, supervenience is to say, once all the physical facts are in, all the mental facts are in. There's no okay. difference at the end of the day. Now, there could be different physical facts on which those mental facts show up, right? Or there mm -hmm. could be, okay, he, like he'll he'll give you that, all right. But once you've got the physical fixed, the mental is fixed 100, percent and there's no mm -hmm. difference between the two. Yeah, okay, I think so. like a mosaic or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like the, the example I use in all the like ad nauseum is there's no like once I know the configuration of the clay, mm -hmm. okay, um, that is all I need to know that it's a statue of Dumbledore, and there's not like right. some other Dumbledore element over and above around, that, over right? And above, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It just boom. Okay, there's no Dumbledore ness now. Right, and you can now, see how that is that is essentially reductive. Yeah. Right, yeah. As an aside, now I would even pick at that and say, well, but it's not a Dumbledore statue without a cultural context. So now we're on our way to like phenomenology. But oh, <laughs> snap, snap! Right, but that's for another day. That's for another day. Let's right, just, yeah. let's let them, let's let the super because I I actually think there's no such thing as supervenience because you could you can't give me an example of it that right. would not presuppose some broader given interpretive context right yes so, right mm -hmm. for another day well, wait mm -hmm. new book coming out on that anyway so, all right so um so searle says okay i'm not a supervenience guy like that but i i will say in it that i go for a kind of weak supervenience he calls it i believe in in the rediscovery of mind okay mm -hmm. he calls it emergence in later stuff but he calls it weak supervenience and what he means by weak supervenience is the mental and the physical are not the very same thing. So there's something more going on in the mental, right? There might be content differences or something like that going on mm -hmm. in the mental that's not in the physical. But uh, there's a causal dependence, right? So, mm -hmm. so all you need for the mental to happen is for the causal to happen, even though they're not the very same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a strong supervenience person, someone like Kim, is going to say, well, the mental and the physical are not identical, but they're the very same thing. There's not an extra thing hanging around. There's no second property. Okay. Right. L later work by Kim actually evolves too on this. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Searle, contrary to the early Kim, says, no, there's something different. There's an extra thing, so to speak. There's an extra property, so to speak. But causally sufficient for it is simply what's going on in the brain. Right. And he calls mm -hmm. it biological naturalism. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, right away, we have to distinguish them between two versions of weak supervenience, right? So, um, like, one might think that it's a matter of, like, it's causal in the sense of necessitation, like, meaning, hey, if you give me a brain like this, absolutely no other way things could go across all possible worlds, but uh, that you get this, you get this mental effect out of it. Distinct, yes. but you get the effect, okay? Um and in the same way that if you give you give me you know certain events the like billiard balls collide, colliding in this context you're going to get this effect out of it right, right? Mm -hmm. okay then you have to have a, another version of like a, what i call in the paper a nominological it's like the one is the necessitating version one's nominological where it's saying yeah there could be different laws of physics in different possible worlds where you get different mental results out of the same physical arrangements right, right? Mm -hmm. so then we're just going to say you know the mental supervenes and the physical as indexed to the possible worlds where there's the same natural laws going on. Yes. There could be another natural laws differently. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't really care which one we go with for the purposes of this paper. Mm -hmm. Right. I think you could run it and actually in the paper in, in, in a very complicated way, I run the argument both ways. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. So it now does. the question is, um, is in this weak sense of supervenience is what's going on in the brain causally sufficient in either a very strong uh, necessitation sense or just in a merely nomological sense it's sufficient for what's going on in the mind. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the setup. So what do I do with this? Okay. All right. So, uh, and this is something I got flack for from a reviewer, like a very good reviewer, right? Um, 
the review process for this paper I found very pleasant. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and I've gotten flack for people I think misreading this paper subsequently. Okay? Right. Um, I am not trying to defend uh, realism or nominalism in the paper. Mm -hmm. It's it just it it was I could have picked a lot of different like metaphysical issues to do this, but I this one I thought worked really well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to defend realism and novels. I'm not presume a lot of people, a lot of like, especially like Thomists uh, who know me assumed the paper was a defense of realism. It's not, it is, it's neutral. It's God forbid agnostic <laughs> on, on, on the, on the, on the realism nominalism issue. Okay. Right. Okay. So what do I mean by nominalism? Well, what I mean by nominalism is I think the example I use in the paper is when Patrick, uh, thinks that Martha is beautiful when he like assents to that proposition, right? Mm -hmm asserts that proposition what's going on there for a nominalist is he's associating martha among a class of things without claiming there's any identity relationship among them mm -hmm. okay so like there's some associative relationship between martha and some other things none of them have anything exactly in common right and but yet this this associative relation presumes that we can like then call them under one single name okay mm -hmm. that, that's what i mean by nominalism all right. I think it's a fair definition of nominalism. But the key yeah. there is the structure of belief in a nominalist situation or a nominalist world, right, uh, is such that what's going on in the belief is an association without identity. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So when I say I believe Martha is beautiful, what I'm saying there is I'm implicitly okay and i mean i'm not explicitly i'm not saying this is going on like like you know when pat when i wrote this paper patrick was eight years old i'm not mm -hmm. saying he was like saying well i'm associating martha with this other class of things but implicitly right. what's going on the structure of belief is this association of among non-identicals okay? yes yeah and for clarity your yeah. son patrick not this patrick yeah my son <laughs> i mean hey you would agree <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. yeah you weren't eight you were what like 20 right so, <laughs> yeah yeah right, 21 right years, yeah, yeah right uh -huh. you're like let's not talk about those years <laughs> right mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway so i actually use patrick and martha in the paper right? yeah mm -hmm. okay and so um what's realism well realism when patrick you know asserts or assents to or otherwise propositionally entertains right <laughs> that um you know, Martha is beautiful. The realist is saying, well, what he's doing is he's recognizing an identity relation of an attribute among all the beautiful things that it's instantiated in Martha, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's by analogy or, or whatever, but there's, there's an identity, right? Okay. Right. So on the one to have a, an anomalous thing, to have a belief would be to have, would, is to associate by non-identity. Okay. And in, for a realist to have a belief is to identify right by a common attribute. Yes. Do, do you right. see that? Yeah. By okay. a general idea, common attribute. By general idea, right. common yeah. idea, however you want to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, and there's, there's as many versions of this as there are realists and nominalists. I just need like a big generic thing. And, yep. and, and, and the key here for the argument is to see that for nominalists and realists, the very structure of belief is different. Mm -hmm. Like yes. what it is to have a belief is different. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. That's the key. Okay. Now for any possible world, either nominalism is true there or realism is true there. I think, I think they're exclusive. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. A middle so ground it's one or exclusive. the other, not it's neither, other. not both. Yeah. Right. One yeah. or the other. Okay. So, so, um, so let's take, uh, Socrates. And I think the example I use in the paper is, is Socrates claim that all men are mortal. Right. Okay. So, in, um, Can somebody please just write a philosophy paper where there's Socrates, Fido, and Tibbles, where you use all three cliches? Yes, in one... I, should, I should have. I should have. Yeah. <laughs> I, that, that now, okay, the gauntlet's thrown down. Right I will one. publish one more paper, and that's it. Right? <laughs> just so I can do just, that. Just, just so I can do it. I'll, I'm, I'm going to embed it in a footnote in a new book somewhere for you. That's right? perfect. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. It's the small things. <laughs> just like just like you're going to be in the index under page 666, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You're like, great. Yeah. <laughs> great. <sweet>. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways, I'll try to make helpful comments for now and continue. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, no, I, yeah, please. Uh, mm -hmm. You can you should not make the mistake of thinking that I take my work seriously. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's a serious argument. So it's a serious yeah, argument. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. so so let's say you've got Socrates, and Socrates mm -hmm. thinks um, uh, all all men are mortal. Okay, mm -hmm. which is certainly he did. Right, mm -hmm. he found out the hard way. Okay, yeah. Right. Now he tested um, that hypothesis. Yeah. So you've got Socrates 
uh, as he exists in worlds where let's suppose now this would be now if if nominalism I got people got all worked up on this too is okay whether nominalism is true or realism is true is going to be a metaphysically necessary fact one way or another mm-hmm, okay mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. let's just talk about like epistemically possible worlds not actual possible worlds okay right. so in those epistemically possible worlds where nominalism is is true okay let's just call that the the guy that shows up there nocrates mm-hmm. okay cool. mm-hmm. all right and now let's uh call the world those epistemically possible worlds where where realism is true let's call that guy rocrates yeah like okay that. Yeah. all right yeah yeah so you got you got Ro, no nocrates and rocrates okay mm-hmm. one is he's just hanging out in all these possible worlds and he's just he's just contemplating the mortality of man right mm-hmm. which you know he's this is Socrates doppelganger, right? right? Okay. And then you've got Rocrates and he's hanging out in all those realist possible worlds and he's just contemplating the mortality of the man. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, but no, by our earlier case we've made, the structure of belief is different between Nocrates and Rocrates. Mm-hmm. Like what counts for having a belief is different between Nocrates and Rocrates. Okay. Mm-hmm. Put them on an MRI. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I'm now, this is a thought experiment, but I don't think we predict there to be any any physiological difference between nocrates and rocrates right right Mm -hmm. i take that and this is the kind of where i just kind of like make my assertion i find that hard to believe that you could seriously say we could determine whether or not we're living in a nominalist world based on what's going on or a realist world based on what's going on in by brain scans by brain scans yeah or any empirical means right so the actual world is either the guy in the actual world is either nocrates and so or or rocrates right Mm -hmm. it's one of those two that fact is not something that we can read off of anything like a brain scan or anything that's accessible to to neurophysiology right right do do you see that okay Mm -hmm. well so and i I see where you're going with it yeah Yeah. so now Mm -hmm. there's a fact and it's a fact about socrates Mm -hmm. and it's a fact about socrates's thinking Mm -hmm. that is in principle impossible to determine by any neurophysiological means anything within the boundaries of socrates himself right yes Mm -hmm. exactly within the boundaries of Socrates himself and moreover in this for this paper like like i go further with it later but in this paper there's nothing physically about socrates yes at any level that will tell us whether he is nocrates or rocrates but he has to be one of those two dudes yes right right so Mm -hmm. now you've got a fact about him and and most importantly a fact about his cognition right Mm -hmm. about his belief that is in principle undeterminable by uh his neurophysiology right Right. and so externalism bam bam yeah yeah well, so like that fact is external to his physiology at that point I'm, I'm just worried about his physiology i'll go further yeah, right yeah because yeah. yeah because we are arguing against a sort of broad physicalism here physicalism so, yeah right, and right. so so like so searle like i so going back to the point of the paper is like look mm-hmm. searle says everything about belief has got to be caused by neurophysiology well this is clearly not something caused by neurophysiology right because because this this cause both nominologically and ne- in terms of necessitation is neutral between two effects, right? Mm-hmm. Between whether or not Socrates' structure of belief is uh, nominalist or it's realist. That yes. is something determined by by no physical cause, right? right. So right. then you've got to say Socrates is in touch somehow with something that is not in any way physical. Yeah, that's great. I love yeah. that. By the way, I did yeah. not I did not read this paper beforehand, sure. so this is all just me yeah. uh, assimilating yeah. it right now, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you can see it. it I mean, I know I called it the easy money argument. It's a pretty complicated argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, but, but it, once like, you have the stage set, it's a pretty quick yeah, shot just, after that. Pretty right? quick yeah. shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we've had people ask on the show, "Hey, Jim, what's your what's your go to anti materialist argument?" This is it. I mean, like mm. I've got a bunch of versions of this because I can see how you've this extended it. this to your Paris argument, actually. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's the uh-huh. origin of the Paris argument. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what? Um. Uh, I mean, that's that's very clear to me. If anybody has any questions, they can ask. But what? Um. What sort of pushback? Or you said you got some flack about this. In other words, what objections have you faced? Yeah. I and mean, why do they? And also- it's funny. I I haven't really gotten a lot of objections to it. Uh, that I don't take up to some degree in the paper. Like people will say, well, you're confusing metaphysics and epistemology. So, mm-hmm. uh, like just because we don't, we can't tell. We can't know whether it's Rocrates or Socrates based on the MRI doesn't mean, right, that he isn't one or the other based on his neurophysiology, right? And and, and my reply to that is, 
all you can go on is all you can go on, right? <laughs> like what this is all we have, right? And moreover, I like I pushed the thought experiment. So what would the neurophysiological difference be that we would expect there to be in a different world where one yes. of these other things like where 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 realism is true or anomalism is true? Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I deal with a lot of those objections just by saying, okay, let's kick it back. Okay, it's a thought experiment. You tell me what should I expect to be different in the physiology, right? Because the way supervenience works is to say, you don't have a mental difference without a physical difference, right? Mm -hmm. And in right, version, right. you don't have a mental difference without a different physical cause. Mm -hmm. Okay, what would the physical cause difference be depending on whether or not we're in a realist or anomalist world, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's nothing you can do with that, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, so this is really cool because this gives you a sort of an externalist uh, motivation for externalism about belief, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I, that excites me. That's really cool because I think that has a lot of advantages to other areas of philosophy, inc including actually philosophy of God and yeah. stuff like that in, yeah. in, in, yeah. in very interesting ways. So I don't want to get into that now, but yeah. I'm just, the gears are sort of turning for me of yeah. like what, what this are, aside from being a, an argument against materialism, which yeah. is always, which is always nice to have. I think there's, it offers other cool resources for other, other debates yeah. as well. Yeah. And, you know, and I've gotten objections like, well, you know, I mentioned this, you know, you know, it seems like, uh, there aren't possible worlds where nominalism is true, says the realist, or there aren't possible worlds where realism is true, says the nominalist, right? And I know the idea of epistemically possible worlds that might turn out to be impossible, sort of counter possibles. Like people, mm -hmm. some people don't like that, right? I think we can clearly talk about them. I think we can clearly make sense of them. I think right. there are boundaries to what can be said about them, right? So I think it's a legit. If we're gonna go, if we're gonna go like analytic philosophy and do thought experiments, and I think that's that's it's fair, it, game. If, if, look, it's fair if, game. Yeah, you this know? is this is in bounds. This is this in is, bounds. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, not uh -huh. necessarily my jam anymore, but I think I think it's, it's it, you it, know it, how I feel about it. But yeah, yeah no, I, exactly, I agree. Yeah. Like this is this is the game we're playing. Yeah. So this is this is this is yeah. a fair play, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, you might not like heel hooks, but if 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 we're uh, if we're in certain rule sets, we get to do them. Right? That's exactly <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. Yeah, that's you awesome. Know? So yeah, I mean, and you know, um, it's funny. I haven't. I'm, you know, someone asked here, you know, have I convinced anybody with it? I don't know. Um, have you successfully convinced a materialist? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I know that paper, I get a lot of notices about it being like downloaded, mm -hmm. right. Or mentioned. So I think it's had some bounce. I don't know. Um, you know, if there's anybody, anybody who's a card carrying, uh, biological naturalist, right. Who, who switched sides. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they can let us know now because it's about to get a lot more. It's about to get a lot more traction. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So give, give us maybe if you wouldn't mind just to because I want to spend a little more time on this because it's fascinating. Maybe um, show us how you've extended this. Uh, we talked about your Paris argument before. I don't know if you want to yeah. sort of reiterate that or how your thinking <sighs> along these externalist lines has continued to develop since 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at this at that point, in my thinking, I wouldn't have said, oh, this shows that minds are external. It just it just showed that minds aren't identifiable to anything uh, physically internal to an organism, right? Okay. Right. It really is just targeted at a uh, physicalism and material physicalism, or right, they're yeah. not they're not they're the conditions for mindedness are not causally sufficient uh, based on what goes on inside the, the nervous system and organism right right Clearly. and at the time I, I would have been much more open to say oh there must be a non-physical element to the organism that's like providing the further causal conditions for for belief all right um now i'm less interested in that right in that and i, I actually i actually think i think we could make we could run a similar argument if you just said well um let's say you know you've got like like i think if we say let's not talk about socrates as a physical entity we would turn socrates into a non-physical entity Right. And we just say it's it's his isolated mind. Right. Or it's his it's his disembodied spirit, something like that. I don't think that solves the problem. Right. I still think like um, what is it internal to like 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 literally like like whether if we say, hey, my first order consciousness is, in fact, not identical to my body, maybe existing in a possible world where there's, I don't have a body at all, like in a Cartesian way. What is it inside internal to? my first order consciousness that would tell me whether, you know, in that world, 
uh, you know, I'm Rokertes or I'm Nokertes. It doesn't seem like there's anything internal to the consciousness either. Right. Really if we fits, even think yeah. of like, it's so hard to like, because like we're even like thinking of like consciousness as like sort of a box, you know what I mean? And I think that's the, the one of the assumptions you're challenging, right? This is just not yeah. the right way that we should even think about minded experience. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so like in my later work, I extend this kind of argument, not just against like, you know, materialist or, or, you know, or emergent naturalists, but even against dualists, right? Right. Yeah. To, to, take, to, that. take that. Yeah. You know what I mean? To say, look, I, I think uh, the whole thing, either way, we're thinking about mind in a way that I think is really defective. And that's not like, cause I'm this genius. I think like the people I'm, I've come to be enamored with, right. Uh, I, I think I've shown me that it's just, there's, it's just a defective way of thinking about mind that begins with internal con conditions. And, and right? do you think that begins with, um, the broadly Cartesian period. Do you think like, for example, do you yeah, think yeah. the traditional thinkers, obviously they're not explicit about this. So the most we can do is, is speculate, yeah. but, but an Aristotle, for example. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, this is something uh, I'm actually going to go talk to uh, a, a good friend of mine and colleague about this this afternoon. Right. I wanted to bring it up to him is, but you know, Aristotle does in De Anima say there's a kind of self-consciousness like you like you sense that you're sensing right mm -hmm. but that's about all you get in terms of like first order like i'm aware of my awareness um in in de anima and he mm -hmm. certainly doesn't seem to think that your awareness of your awareness is a condition of your having the awareness mm -hmm. you know what i mean so mm -hmm. this is where i think like it may be about mental content there's a kind of externalism going on already in Aristotle, right? Yeah. Do you uh -huh. see what I mean? Right. Um, or at least like like questions of like, you know, what's my soul like in a possible world where I don't have a body do not occur to these guys, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So so I do think, you know, whether it's the, whoever we want to, like whatever early modern figure we want to blame this on, right? I do think that specifically the idea that we just, we, we, we look for what mindedness is by simply introspectively looking inside ourselves, whether that's behind our skull or in our our self-consciousness i do think it's at least that becomes the central question in the modern period right yeah right, right. yeah i uh, yeah i agree that's yeah. that's awesome yeah. shall we take a few questions from the yeah, audience let's do professor yeah. all right uh so ryan says the computational theory of cognition seems to be the most widely expected could we expect a difference in brain structures uh would lead to a to different computation i think it means computational beliefs between nominalism versus realism yeah, I mean, actually, I've had that raised before, something like that before. And the way I would deal with it, it's a good question, right? Um, the way I would deal with it is to say, look, I don't think nominalism or realism predicts different beliefs as outcomes between Nocrates or Rocrates, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, whether whether or not Pat's in a nominalist universe or whether or not Pat's in a realist universe, I don't think that indicates that he's going to have a different view about whether or not Martha's beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, even if, even if we had, let's say we did take a computationalist, uh, understanding of cognition, which I would recommend against heavily, but so was we, Searle, right? Yeah. So it's Searle. Yeah. Right. Um, that's among the things like, like, I'm like, I, like, I probably agree with Searle on like 90% of the things he has to say. Right? right. Um, anyway. And so, um, the, uh, let's, let's suppose, let's suppose we grant the argument, a computational theory of mind. Right. Um, we decided to continue to ruin cognitive science by doing that. And, um, you know, I don't think we would expect a different computational outcomes depending on whether or not nominalism or realism is true. Now, and I think this becomes an argument against the computational theory of mind because there's a fact of the matter of whether or not nominalism or realism is true that is relevant to what it is to have a belief. And then here, any computational story you tell is neutral to that outcome. Therefore, it's not the explanation, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Sorry, your video got a little choppy there, but you're oh, back sorry now. About that. Cool. We're all good. All right, let's do one more and then maybe close this out. Uh, Berenjen wants to know, Jim, what is your philosophy of reality? Your entire ontology. Yeah. <laughs> well, Give it to us all, question. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't mean to be snotty, Berenjen, but I'm, I'll just say I'm working on that, right? I'm right, working yeah. on that. Uh, I mean, I think I think in and so in in the most recent book, I kind of like. Uh, and probably to the reader, frustratingly avoid metaphysical and ontological questions at like mm -hmm. any serious level, right? And so now the next move for me 
is that i think i think we'll, that's where we'll I'm be to, to do that yeah. right yeah yeah so i think the next big ticket project is to get back and like try to like quit writing all these promissory notes and do some serious metaphysics again roll up the right? sleeves and do the yeah. metaphysics i mean right? i'll say this yeah. is i i think probably you would i mean ultimately you're going to see me settle in some kind of settle into me it's 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 where i've always been right some broadly aristotelian ontology right right mm -hmm. but i haven't tried to put all that together with the more recent work in philosophy all the uh, yeah in mind i mean that's how to, like i mean to be a systematic philosopher means you have to be systematic yeah. so you yeah. you know one area of investigation leads you to another and then that investigation causes refinements in your belief which then goes back to your original point of yep. investigation there's this this constant pushing yep. and pulling and refinement and adjustment and all that right and that's that's just a project of worldview design and development. Yeah, isn't it is. It, right? and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll even say this is, you know, as much as I like to complain about my job on air, um, <laughs> this is the advantage of having uh, a teaching position at the kind of institution I teach at, right? Because like the disadvantage is like the boss doesn't really care about my work but the advantage is then also the boss doesn't really care about my work right so in terms and of you research, can actually right? like do legit philosophy rather than be yeah. pressured for various yeah and so like if i want to say hey, reasons, i'm going right, to work yeah. for you know 10 years on a new direction in in thinking about thinking um and then kind of get that done and then kind of like i'll go over and see how i can relate that to like you know very broad issues in ontology and metaphysics I can get away with doing that because there's no expectation that I that I'm going to be productive in some specific area. Whereas if you work at like, you know, more prestigious places, there's incredible pressure to like be the guy in some particular thing. And so I, I have the I have the luxury of saying, get back to me in 10 years and I change my mind. Right. Yeah, you're right. Which yeah. is um, far more interesting to me, yeah, generally speaking. So. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, let's uh, make some mentions and plugs. Jim, your new course, please uh, remind us of that. Yes. Yeah, I have a new course on Heidegger's uh, question concerning technology. Uh, it is available at the link I just put up here in the uh, in the discussion section. Um, mm -hmm. It is a two lecture course uh, with uh, lots of audio visual aids with it this time. Um, it's a little less formal. Uh, and, and run more on the slides, which is new for me. And uh, it is, as always, available for what you think it's worth and what you can afford. So if you can't afford anything, take it, right? If you can, help a brother out, right? And uh, I appreciate it. Picking, up a, picking up a course. Sorry, we're fading out. Uh, you got me again? Yeah, yeah, must be must I be a cons you. must be a conspiracy. Could be, um, could be. Yeah, could could well be. So support the channel in whatever ways that you can. Pick up yourself yep. up a, a new Heidegger course or nihilism course. Of course, I've yep. got my my Gumroad courses too. Yeah, go ahead. Up. But always liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, all that stuff helps. And we appreciate you guys. And we'll catch you next time. Adios. Thank you.